Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Start crying before I even get up here. <laughs> I'm Matt, I'm a grateful alcoholic. I'm going to get my eye cleared out. By the amazing grace of God and program of action and service called Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm alive and sober today. I say that for me and not for you because it amazes me that, that God would give me the grace to have the life I have today, a scumbag like me. And because of this program of action and service called Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, I'm happy to be alive and sober today. You see, I never was happy to be alive or sober. And because of this program, I'm happy to be that way today. I'd like to thank uh, Lee for asking me to come down here to Florida. Uh, when he listened to, he got this tape of me from Oklahoma, and he was saying that he told me he got this tape, and he seen this Matt G from Fresno, California. He goes, "Who's this jerk?" and and uh, and he listened to it and then called and asked me to speak. And, you know, he told me a bunch of who they had lined up for this. And, and I told him, oh, so you want one sicko to come, you know. <laughs> he goes, yeah, that's it. And I'd like to clear this up right from the start. A lot of you I know are here under false pretenses. Here's it. my gal friend. My wife's name is Peggy G, but I have a girlfriend here. Peggy P. She, and me and my wife just love her to death, but she's been running around telling all you guys that you have to come here, you have to come here. I'm just this killer speaker. You gotta hear me, you gotta hear me. So if when this is over, you're pissed off, Peggy P will be right outside the doors there. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And you take it up with her, you know. <laughs> this has been a lot of fun. We've been in Florida since uh, last Saturday, and we've been all over a lot of Florida and, and seeing old friends and new friends and meeting a lot of people. And I've come to realize that the people in Florida and Alcoholics Anonymous are really sick, too. <laughs> uh, you know, I've, I've had the privilege of, uh, like, like Elmer said, talking at the prison here and and I, I talked at a couple other places, and, and those people at those other places are here today, and they said, God, we're so looking forward to seeing you, hearing you again. And, and God, some of them were just two days ago, and it's like... <laughs> you know, it's been fun, because a lot of times, you know, when, when you get the privilege to do this, you, you meet these friends and stuff, and a lot of times we don't see each other at, except for at these conferences, and it's been fun to have dinner and lunches and stuff with with old friends and new friends, and uh, it's just been a great time, and everybody here been so nice, and and sometimes when we go do this deal, uh, me and Peggy were talking about it, that, you know, you're assigned the host, and sometimes the conference is over, and you never knew who your host was. And it's like this conference here, it's like they assign you a host, but you got a whole bunch of people trying to be your host, you know. You know, just willing to do anything they can. And and I think that's a really good deal. You know, if you're going to be involved in service and stay sober and find a happy, joyous, free life, you need to do the commitments around here. That's what the old timers taught me, that I need to learn the commitments. You know, this is a hospital and institution uh, speaker portion of this. And I am... Not just a member of the, well, it's out here, what do you call it, the correction? Uh, and in California, we call it the hospital and institution committee. And I'm, I'm part of the, the best committee there is in the whole world. And if you don't think yours is, you need to do something about it to try to make it so you feel that it is the best in the world. We cover, California is, uh, well, I started to tell you that, that I'm not just a member of the hospital and institution for me. I'm an active member. And I have missed some of our monthly meetings. In 12 years, I missed three meetings. Twice I was having surgery. 
And once I came back from talk, doing a talk and a hot water pipe had broke under the slab in my kitchen, I had to jackhammer the floor out that night. And I know that's not an excuse, but... <laughs> but I did it, you know, and... Uh, you know, I, I've done all the different types of service in Alcoholics Anonymous. I, I got involved in general service for a lot of years, and I was the intergroup chair for a lot of years, and, and my place is, is a hospital and institution committee, and, and I actively go on panels into the prisons, and the prisons are my favorite place to go. And, and you know, never had to been in prison before to go to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. At least in California, the inmates there, if you start talking about your prison stuff, they'll ask you to please be quiet. They know how to do that. They want to know how we stay sober on the streets. And it's a, you know, I love going to penitentiaries. Uh, I, you know, I, I love having a captive audience. See, <laughs> you guys can get up and walk out of here and, and those penitentiaries, they can, if they go in that meeting, they're stuck, you know. <laughs> It's a pretty good deal. You know, uh, I don't get to go into prisons as much as I used to in California. Uh, California is the largest growing prison population. That we just build them everywhere. You know, pretty quick we're probably just going to fence off all of California and call it a penitentiary. But. Uh, you know, they revised the, the clearance procedure in California, and if you have a violent felony conviction, you're not allowed in penitentiaries anymore. And, and so I got all my clearances taken away. I'm back going to prison again because a warden wanted me in there to get the means going back in. And, and I told her I couldn't because of that, and, and she said, well, she would fix it to where I couldn't. She gave me a year-long gate pass, so I'm back taking the means in the prison again. And... And I missed it the other night because I was here. But Elmer gave me the privilege of getting to go in the penitentiary. And for that, I'm truly grateful. You know, I, uh, <laughs> especially this morning, everybody's been, I, everybody, they must have passed tapes of me out here. You know, I never do the same talk twice. That, to me, that would be boring. And that's just me. I, uh, I just, Sitting up here just like usual, I say, God, if you ain't there, I'm screwed. And uh, <coughs> just start talking, so I never know what it's going to be like. And and people's been telling me, man, I love that part of your story where you said this, and you said that part of your story where you said that. And, and if I don't get the story and you like to hear, it's because there's not enough time in this meeting. Uh, Lee did say he put a two-hour tape in, but... <laughs> No, not really. <laughs> but we're supposed to tell what it was like, what happened, what it's like today. You know, and what, and what I can tell you about what it was like, most of that is hearsay. I don't really know. <laughs> you, yeah, <laughs> you put the hearsay together in the police, uh, the printout set from the police departments, and you, and you can come up with a lot of my life. I have seven ex-wives that remind me all the time of things I did. And <laughs> but, so what I can basically tell you about what it was like is through a lot of inventories and alcoholics anonymous. The, the old timers and the sponsor I have, they were real uh, into that, doing a lot of writing. Oh, I forgot. Well, that, if there's new people here, I hope you get this part. You see, last March, and, and don't get ahead of me here. A lot of people do. Last March was 23 years I've been going to Alcoholics Anonymous. But my sobriety date is January 26, 1987. And that's only 12 years. And the reason why I only have 12 years instead of 23 years is because for almost 12 years, I did it Matt's way. You know, I didn't do it the way that the people here that stay sober did it. But so, you know, our book says we're selfish and self-centered. Speaking about selfish and self-centered, my wife's an Al-Anon. I love being married to an Al-Anon today. 
I know that's true. I, I've been telling Lee he needs to hook up with one of these all on women. You know, you hook up with an A woman and and if you're selfish and self-centered and you're all you think about, then if you hook up with another alcoholic, you know, and then you expect them to think about you, it's just not going to happen, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I got me an Al-Anon and now I know there's at least two of us thinking about me, you know. So. <laughs> I, I, uh, I love my wife Peggy more than anything in the world. It's the greatest thing that happened to me in sobriety. You know, we made a commitment, just like we do our program, that, that no matter what, we just don't go there and we don't get the divorce and we're going to work through this still. No matter what, we're willing to go to any lengths for the commitment of this marriage. It has been a really good marriage. Uh, Monday will have been married uh, two years. And... <laughs> And we've been together for over three years, and I, living together, going out, marriage, nobody's ever lasted two years. Two years, you know, and I would say that when I would get married, when they get to the part, till death do you part, I said, till death do you part, or two years, whatever comes first. <laughs> <laughs> and she is my only marriage in, in uh, sobriety, and, and I like that. I, I'm not one of these that had half these marriages and sobriety. I'm not saying that's wrong or anything. I just, I, I'm grateful that I took the time to find me first. But you know, when I was in the third grade, my parents got a divorce. You're probably thinking, well, what has that got to do with this? A lot of people get divorced. But you see, that's that part I was talking about in the book. It says we're selfish and self-centered. I see my parents were getting a divorce and, and I had these feelings of feeling abandoned and unloved and unwanted and, and nobody cared and everybody's picking on me and you know this isn't happening to nobody in the world. I got brothers but it's not happening to them, just to me. And I don't know how your mind works but, but my mind when, when all this crap's going on that I can't deal with, I bypass all bad stuff and I get straight into the good stuff. And my my mind clicks into what, cause see, I want to be happy. I don't want to feel stuff. And my mind clicks into my parents' parties and, and people would drink and they'd laugh and, and they'd dance and, and it's seemingly like they enjoy life. Now, since I've been sober and went back over it, I remember the beatings and the, the divorces and the cops coming and the puking and I remember that now in the inventories, but my mind don't go there. That's My mind bypasses all that stuff. So I went and got my mom's Bacardi rum in her bedroom, and I guzzled the heck out of it. And I'd love to stand up here and tell you, boy, I, I became real macho, and my muscles popped out, and I became good looking, and my toes felt like dancing. But for me, that wasn't true. That stuff went down and tasted nasty and, and I smelled puke before and, and, and I knew my mom would catch me if I threw up in her bedroom and, and so I mean I held my hand and my, my hand over my mouth and my nose and that stuff went up 20, 30 times before it would ever stay down and I can remember thinking, you know what? My parents are getting divorced and they don't love me anymore and I'm less than I'm everything but you know what that alcohol did for me was it didn't matter. It wasn't glorious. It just, what was going on in my life just didn't matter. Like the book talks about, I had that seize of ease and comfort. You know, what was going on around me just didn't matter. And I didn't know I was going to chase that effect that alcohol produced. And on a progressive basis, finding that excuse where I had to drink was less and less. And when you're in the third grade, it's hard to get booze. <laughs> so... <laughs> so you make buddies with a guy down the street you can't stand because his dad's a liquor salesman and the garage is full of booze and you start burglarizing houses now you don't want all this stuff you just want the booze but you gotta make it look like a burglary so you steal everything and throw the TVs and everything away and keep the booze 
And then the kids would pick on you before school, and you're just scared little wimpy kid, and you can't fight, and you cry, and you're just a sickening little wimp. And you can't stand it no more, and you drink before school because you can't stand dealing with life and being unloved and being picked on. And you get to school, and the first kid comes up to you and starts picking on you, and you whip his butt. You turn this raving maniac, and... You know, by the time you get to the first period class, you've done with four guys' butts. And all of a sudden, the word spreads across the school. Don't mess with that Matt Green kid. He's crazy. So you become the tough guy of the school. And, and what I didn't realize that, that this was going to be a safe area that I chased for a lot of years. You know, in the seventh and eighth grade dances come along and and you're this tough guy now, and, and the fear of being rejected, you can't face that. So instead of going and asking a girl to dance, you stand in the back, looking tough, all alone, and feeling less than. And you don't want to dance so bad, but you can't face that fear of the rejection. And one of your buddies might hear a girl tell you no. And you find out you can drink before the dance, and all of a sudden, when you appear in there, those girls were real lucky to have you there to ask them to dance. <laughs> now, my mom and dad were both alcoholics. And uh, my mom died sober. Uh, and she was a... She died sober, but, but she was one of those miserable, cranky, just unhappy people that die sober. And Alcoholics Anonymous, because she didn't do the deal here. She got a sponsor and kind of worked the steps and, and did some service work, but she never did the steps. And so she died with, uh, I think it was 12 years of sobriety. But she was really hated life. And, and you know, I want more than that out of life. But to find my parents, we had to find them in a bar. And of course, my mom you know what kind of boyfriends she bought home, these really super nice guys. <laughs> and that's not a lie, they were really super nice guys. Not drinking. But drinking, my mom could attract these violent ones. And so when they were drunk and come home, and me being the oldest child, I guess I was just the one designated to be the punching bag. And I got tired of waking up in a pool of my own blood and the day before I turned 13, I moved into uh, out of home and into the president of the Hells Angels in Fresno at that time. And, and I walked in his front door. You know, I knocked and he said, "Come in." I was going to start living there, and and uh, I walked in, and, and there here was this gorgeous blonde with her hand down his pants, and I, I immediately wanted what they had. <laughs> <laughs> I was willing to go to any lengths to get it, too. You know? <laughs> I never did achieve any of that, but boy, I was sure a goal to shoot for. And, uh, you know, I got drunk enough that first night, I must have said yes to eating some pills. And I don't remember that night. That's not the first blackout I had. and uh, But it was the first time I could not get up in the morning and go to work. And they told me, take some of this white stuff. You know, you'll make it to work. And, you know, a couple minutes after taking that, I was dancing around getting dressed. And I thought, God, you know, I'm finding heaven here. And I made it to work. And, and the guy I worked for, he he got drunk and loaded, you know. And, and my job at 13 years old was to take transmissions out. And they rebuilt them, and I put them back in. And, and I'm under their work, and I think I'm working real fast and my boss comes over and kicks the creeper and goes man you must have took too much of that white stuff you're not getting no work done all you're doing is spinning round and round on the creeper because <laughs> you better take some uh, drink something and slow down and, and if you're the type of alcoholic like me I always overshoot the boundary because next thing I know he's kicking the creeper and saying man you better take some more white stuff all you're doing is sleeping you know <laughs> You know, I got home that night and I drank and I drank and I drank because you see, I'm afraid of drugs. And, you know, alcohol's my deal. And, 
and I couldn't go to sleep, and I ate some more pills, and, and the next morning started the process all over again, and that started a, a really roller coaster life for me, trying to find any combination of anything to be functional in the world. You know, I'm going to the juvenile hall systems, and I just want to see how a blind guy tells time. Oops. Uh, I'm going to the juvenile hall systems and already, and you know I'm scared to death going in there. But that's part of the role that you 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 just got to do the drill, and it makes you just you have more notoriety if you go to juvenile halls and jail and get arrested. And, and I loved running with the Hell's Angels. You know, we pull up to a bar, and people hear the motorcycles pulling up. And they don't even look for, they just dive out windows to get away from you. And, and this was a good deal for me. You see, when, when I'm that crazy, the further back you back up away from me when I walk down the street, the safer it is for me. You see, because the further away you are from me, the safer it is that you won't find out that I'm scared and afraid inside. And I want to cry and and so it's safer for me to just keep doing crazier and crazier things to make you stay further and further away. <laughs> you know, I wanted to turn 18 so I could go to jail like tough guys do. And uh, my dream came true. I turned 18 and went to jail. <laughs> yeah. I got arrested for armed robbery and attempted murder. I shot a cop. And I don't know what kind of alcoholic you are, but every time I get arrested, I, I do an inventory. I sit in there and go over what went wrong, what I shouldn't have done, who I shouldn't have hang out with. Uh, I'm sitting in that jail cell. You know, I, like, like, see, I don't mind going to jail because that goes along with the role I'm playing. But I want to, I, I want to start going to jail for like, uh, assault and battery, minor robbery, something like that. I don't want to start out shooting cops. I kind of like want to build up to that later, you know. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, I, I'm sitting in that jail thinking, man, what do people do to keep, you know, from going to jail like this right from the gate? It's like, oh, they're getting married and having kids and just boring, you know. But I thought, well, you know what, you better do it. You, you know, you're going to be alive for a couple more years and, and, and you don't want to spend the last two years of your life locked up. Um, there's a lot of people you got to pay out there. People in society that's making this animal out of you. So, uh, I, I, when I got out of jail, I checked with all the girls I was engaged to, and, and one of them said she was pregnant. And back then, if you got a girl pregnant, you married her. And this was a heck of a commitment for a guy like me, you see. That's, that's, you're too close in marriage. You have to show some kind of feelings or something. And that's too scary a place for me. You know, so this, this was a heck of a commitment to do that. And, and that girl, she either lied to me or we need to go in the world against book of records because that kid didn't come out for 18 months. And, uh, <laughs> And I was a little bit pissed about that, Dylan. <laughs> and so, of course, it didn't work, and, and we split up, and I shot another cop, and, you know, I had some indictments for him. You guys did geographics. I never did geographics. You know, when they have an indictment for your arrest, you move out of state. It's looking after your own butt. You know, it's it's not a geographic. It's, it's smart thinking. And so I moved to Reno, Nevada, and that was my problem. You know, I was born in this little hick cowboy town, and you know, I needed to be in the big cities, and you get up to Reno, and they got bright lights and 24-hour gambling, and so a lot of excitement. You drink 24 hours a day, and I found heaven. The problem was is I took me with me. And within a week, I'm sitting in the Sparks County Jail. Thinking, God, you know, how'd they know I got here so fast? Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I did things like that. I, you know, I tried Hawaii and, you know, I ended up in jail in Hawaii. I go, well, at least I'm ending up in a little higher class jail. And I moved to Ensenada and 
first down in Ensenada, I'm sitting in the jail down there and saying, this was definitely a wrong decision to come down here. But for me, I, it seemed like I got out of everything I got into. I, I always had a lot of money and always knew the right people and, and I'd get out of everything or, or the cops would screw up and so they'd have to dismiss the charges. And, and what this was doing was building up a deal inside me that, you know what, people can't make me mine. The teachers, parents, cops, nobody can make me mine. And, the, and society made, is making me this animal, so I'll do whatever I want to do. You know, the Vietnam War is going on, and you know, I just, it just seems like I can't stay out of jail. You know, I'm going to jail three to five times a week on a regular basis, and I mean, that's all right, but it's just, I like to give, you know, have a month reprieve here or something. And so I thought, well, I'll go into service, and I'll join the service, and I can legally go over and kill people. And, you know, and, and Bill's story, it says I had arrived well, I rode from Reno, Nevada on my Harley Davidson and, and the recruiter's office at that time in Fresno, you had to go up all these steps to get inside. And I rode my Harley up them steps and inside, <laughs> shut that oil leak and barely running thing off and told them, I'm the one you're looking for. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand why, but they weren't real impressed, you know. But, uh, <laughs> You know, I took their stupid test and I passed everything and I told them, okay, you can go in. When do you want to go in? I go, because well, I had a indictment for me in Reno, Nevada. And they were getting really close. I thought, you know, today would be fine. And they said, no, you got to come back tomorrow and you can go in tomorrow. And when I got back the next day, they said, well, we can't let you in the service. I go, why? And they said, well, we have your civilian record. It says in there you like to kill people. I said, I told you, I'm the one you're looking for. <laughs> And they informed me that they were worried about our guys getting me to Vietnam. <laughs> Through some people I knew, I did get to go in the service. And, and, you know, this is a big commitment to me. You know, I, And I'm going to go in there, and they're going to straighten my life out. It's going to take probably two or three months and get me straightened out. And, and I'm going to become a 10-star general. And, and I know you're going, they don't have 10-star generals. And that's true. They don't. I'm going to become the first one. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sell dope in there, and I'm gonna sell stolen army tanks and bazooka guns, and, and I figure by about a year and three months, I'm gonna become a millionaire, and I'm just gonna make a military career out of this deal. Live happily ever after, and, and, and that's a big commitment for a guy like me, so I had to buy a lot of stuff to get to uh, basic training, and, and when it got time to go, I get out to get on the bus and say, Matthew Green, I said, yeah, and they said, no, this bus over here, and they shipped me from Fresno to Monterey, and I don't know if you know about that, but it's only a three-hour trip. And uh, if you buy all this stuff to go back east, uh, you know, a good alcoholic can't waste all that booze. So I had to guzzle it real fast, and, and I get there, and, and I know they forgot to tell them that I was coming, and I'll give you proof of that. Because if they knew I was coming, they wouldn't have sent a screaming drill sergeant out to the bus, because People don't scream at me. I don't take too kindly to that. When this guy is at the bottom of the steps screaming at me, because I'm a little slow getting off that bus, you know. I'm sitting there doing another inventory. I think, you know, do you, do you guys always like me? You got good plan A. Plan B ain't never worth a darn, but plan A, plan A always seems real good. I'm sitting there thinking, you know, I'll just let him scream for a little while and Maybe his lungs will get tired. And by then, I'll mosey out this bus, and, and for yelling at me, I'll let him know who's boss. When I'm, I hit that bomb step, I put everything into it, and hopefully one punch that dude, and he'll go out like a light. Plan A works real good. I hit that bottom step, and I one punch that dude, and he went out like a light. But there was two about seven foot eight gorilla drill sergeants behind him. <laughs> <laughs> And 10 minutes of my service career, I'm already locked up in the stockade. <laughs> As usual, I'm doing another inventory. <laughs> this is a bad mistake. And I'd get out and uh, I'd go AWOL and they'd catch me and they'd bring me back and I'd go back to the stockade and 
I, I'd get out and I, I'd whip somebody else's butt and I'd end up back in the stockade. And, and one time out, I did some things I shouldn't have done and ended up in a federal penitentiary. You know, and they didn't want me there and, uh, I, the Vietnam War is going on and I'm in the service and, and so the service got me back. And the service, I, you know, I went to the stockade there and I got out of there because they didn't want me in the armed forces anymore either. And, and I left there thinking, you know what, the government can't make me mine. Why don't you just set out to make the whole world pay for what's done? I was really angry and bitter and hate. You know, that fear inside you that you tried everything you can try now, and, and, and even the United States government can't make you mine, so there's nothing left. There's no hope. But society made you this animal. Set out and do everything in your power to make them pay for what they've done to you. And I'd do things like ride my Harley down the street, and if I see you sitting on a bus stop with a smile on your face, I'd lock it up and jump off, and I'd run over there and I'd whip you. And I'd beat on you till you were out cold in a pool of blood. And then I'd kick you in the head one more time laying there on the ground. I, and I can remember a lot of times saying, you deserve that, you scumbag. You know, because that, see, seeing you lay there bleeding and hurting physically made me feel like you hurt as bad as I hurt inside. And you're part of society. You made this animal out of me. You deserve it. You know, the court system's found it necessary to start sending me to Alcoholics Anonymous at age 23. And I went to my first meeting and, and uh, you know, I identified. I mean, everything's, that's me. But you see, I drove a brand new Corvette to that first meeting and I had 50 employees. I had over $100,000 in the bank and I was on my fifth good looking wife. And, you know, being married five times, they told me that may, that's unmanageability in your life. And it's like, okay, it could be, but she's still good looking. <laughs> so, okay, yeah, I am an alcoholic. Yeah, my life is unmanageable. I can't stay out of jail. You know, I mean, I don't even get a, need a bail bondsman anymore. I got credit at the jail. I just signed my John Henry, and they let me go. And a couple hours later, I'm back in there. You know, I don't go too far by this time. And, And, uh, you know, I looked at the deals that, that, see, them guys were real old in that meeting. They were, you know, 40, 45 years old. They had these, uh, newcomer looking cars and, you know, so, yeah, I'm an alcoholic, but I'm not an alcoholic of your type, see. So there's no willingness to do anything different. And I had to go through this year long recovery program for a year and, and, and I did, I didn't drink for that whole year. For all nine months, that was close enough. <laughs> uh, and, I, and I got a chip, and and I was in there for alcohol only, and so I would take drugs the whole time. And and a district attorney friend of mine told me something at the end of nine months of going to this program. There's something you can take that shows you haven't had a drink at all because they only use the breathalyzer test. And this only works on the breathalyzer test. And there's probably some new people sitting on the edge of their seat waiting to hear the secret. <laughs> but I'm not going to tell you. <gasps> but you can take it, and it shows you haven't had a drink. Well, and they were so pissed off in that recovery home because I, I'd be falling out of the chair. I came and sit, and they'd give me the test. And, you know, I'm going to the, the net ward for the violent crimes, and I'm getting to wear the, the white sports coats they give you there, and, you know, just... <laughs> You know, the, the slit in the wrist are starting to come because life's no fun no more. And, then, you know, I'm getting 25, 26 years old. And, you know, uh, just life really sucks. And I'm not supposed to be alive. And I don't want to be here. And, and you know, when I am kind of out of the influence of something, I remember about an old man I'd kiss the whip or a cop I'd shot and, or knock my mom through a plate glass window or something. And I feel like a piece of crap. And I... You know, the guilt and the shame and the remorse that goes through you. And, and you know, i got to find something to shut that madness off. And it's just never ending. You know, find that combination to work to where you put what you become and you don't notice it. And you can justify in your mind and actually believe that they they deserve what you dished out to them. You know, when I married my seventh wife, I'm kind of like really pissed I'm alive. 
you know, we're going to have this baby in this ranch and everything's going to be wonderful and, and this is just going to be till I die, hopefully within a couple of years. And, and that all came true. I got the wife and the kid and the ranch and the chickens and ducks and pigs and horses and all that crap that goes with it. But once again, I was still there. And I kicked her out one time and she wouldn't come back. I thought, you know what, here's another wife not going to take off with another one of my kids. I grabbed a shotgun, stopped at 7-Eleven, and I bought two balls of champagne because I'm going to blow her head off. I'm going to take that baby, I'm going to run. And, and I get over there, and her neighbors are outside, and she's not home, and it don't matter. I kick the window, and I'm sitting in there taking all this stuff, waiting for her to come home, and the SWAT team comes. And, and you know what, I can't shoot another cop no more. But I'm a tough guy. I got this image to keep up, and I can't walk out and say, hey, I give up. Let's go to jail. I can't do that either. And I can't shut my head off anymore. Any combination of anything doesn't work anymore. And all this madness goes on in my head, and, and I just hate life so desperately. And it came in my head that my kid had told me a couple of days before that, my older kid, he said that he was ashamed of me and he wished I was dead, that him and his friends were tired of seeing me in the newspapers and on TV for for crimes I committed, and, and can I just leave the face of the earth? And he's so ashamed of me. And I thought, you know what, my kids would be better off without me in the world. And I'd been going to AA off and on by this time for a little over eight years. And I stuck that shotgun in my head and I pulled the trigger. And months and months later when I came to out of that coma, I'm laying there in the hospital bed with every movable part of my body with leather restraints on it one more time. And I was 100% blind. I'm still most of the way blind. This is just real blurry. I can't see nobody out there. It, it is a, you know, I, a lot of people tell me, God, that must be terrible being most of the way blind. And that's not, man. All the women in A look good to me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there ain't an ugly one in the bunch, man. <laughs> you know, and, uh, uh, you know, so I'm 100% blind, and, 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 you know, a lot of people call me airhead, and I can't argue that point, because uh, a lot of the insides of my head is missing. See, you can physically walk up and stick your fist inside my head. So much of it was missing. And I have this plate that snaps up inside my head, so it allows me to be able to talk. If I, if I was to pull that out right now, I can't talk. And they flew in life support systems from all over the world, and they told me, boy, you're going to, going to die on a daily basis. The doctors would come in and tell me that. And I'd hear this beeping crap from these life support systems. And, and those people from A, God, the nerve of them. They'd come in, they asked me if they could read me the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Like I had a choice in the matter, you know. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so uh, they would sit down and read that book to me. And, and they didn't just do it one day, and they just didn't do it for 10 minutes or so. They did it like in two-hour shifts, and they do it all day and all week and month after month after month. And I finally got out there, and I, you know, the outside world didn't understand why I shot myself. And, you know, I, I want to die so desperately. I'm going to be taken advantage of. I'm 100% blind and no face. And I'll never have a her. And I went back with my seventh ex-wife, and, boy, that was a mistake. Thank God someone else was married to her today. Uh, <laughs> God bless her. But, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and I'm going to three to five meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous on a day, and, you know, I'm identifying with everybody still just like I have for all these years. But see, now I'm really different. Now I'm blind and I don't have no face. I'm dying. I'm definitely different than you. And I would do things like when they gave me their phone numbers, I'd tell them, oh, you're stupid for giving a blind guy your phone number, and I'd wad it up and throw it on the ground. You see, and I'm blind and no face and dying on a daily basis, and I expect you to come give me a ride to Alcoholics Anonymous. I expect you to sit me down and go get me a cup of coffee. I expect you to do the things for me. And you know what? The people in Alcoholics Anonymous did do that. It's not like they didn't do the deal. They did do it. But you see, the miracle, the gift of alcoholics and amas doesn't work going to three to five meetings every day if you don't reach your hand out. 
See, so the, the miracle here couldn't happen because I didn't reach my hand out. And I'm different than you and I expect you to do it for me. And they would do things like, uh, let's go to the coffee shop after the meeting today, man. I go, I can't. I hurt too bad. He said, okay, well, we'll see you tomorrow. You know, I, I got the sponsor. You know how they come up to you if you're new and they say, you know, you got a sponsor and you say no and they lay this sob story on you. You know, oh, God, you're not going to make it. You know, so you pick a sponsor that don't go to the meetings you go to. And uh, that way when they come up and ask you, Matt, you got a sponsor, you tell them, yeah, I got a sponsor. And they pat you on the back and they say, Matt, you're doing a good job. You're going to make it. And they leave you alone. If you're one of those that do that to newcomers, maybe you ought to go a step further. Because see, if they would have ever went further and said, do you ever call them, I'd been screwed. See? <laughs> I don't know what it is. I won't volunteer you any information when I'm going to Alcoholics Anonymous, but I won't lie to you. But you're going to have to ask me. <laughs> so I had all these surgeries, and I saved up 455 synthetic morphine tablets in it almost two years of going to a three to five means of doing the fellowship of alcoholics and Alice on a daily basis and life really sucks. I took all 455 of those synthetic morphine tablets. Now the shotgun didn't work but these pills will. That's enough to do the job. And I came to out of that coma uh, some days later and, and I don't think I have to tell you but I was really pissed. <laughs> And what really pissed me off, first of all, is all those years of going to A, it was like a Star Trek movie on warp speed in my head going round and round. Get a sponsor, work the steps, get on your knees, pray to God. It's like, shut up, man. You know, <laughs> I thought, you know what, you're pretty tired. Maybe you ought to do it. Life's, you know, see, it came to my head that, you know what, that there must be this God in this world and, and that God ain't going to let you die. He ain't done with you, dummy. And if you keep doing it your way, all you're going to keep doing is missing body parts. <laughs> <laughs> and by this time in my life, you know, the years of riding motorcycles and the motorcycle wrecks and getting shot and stabbed and shooting yourself and, you know, my whole body is just all been transplanted and plates and pins and bolts and nuts and wires and screws and there I mean my body's like a walking scar tissue, you know. People ask, why didn't you ever get tattoos? Oh hell there's no room for them, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but so I picture this, you know, that I wanna keep drinking going to alcoholics and I'm until I end up in a nut where never to come out left the and they're not going to give me no Thorazine or nothing. I'm going to have to sit there and think and miss body parts all the time. I can't afford to miss no more body parts. It's really, it's really, you know, I have a lot of physical pain on a daily basis. I mean, you know, see, you learn here to look for the solution. And the solution is with all these phony parts and stuff and metal parts and stuff. See, when you have an ailment, you go see the doctor and he does this and this and this. Well, you got to go see a specialist. So you go see the specialist, and he does test after test, and CAT scan, and MRIs, and all this. And, okay, well, now we got to check with another one. And, you know, they, oh, yeah, yeah, now you need surgery. So you got to go through this process of that and go give blood and all that. And they do the surgery, and you go to recovery. And, God, it's just a lot of work. When I have something go wrong, I just go see the one of the dudes, man, and they put a little slit in there, and they get a little gun out, and they go, and I screw that part, and they, they screw that part back in, and down the road you go, you know, you got a new part. You know? <laughs> but it is a lot of physical pain on a daily basis. I mean, there's days it's just a major chore just to get out of bed because you hurt so bad. But I, I, I want to tell you a little God story here because, see, I got off my knees out of that coma and when I came out of that coma and I looked up and I said, God, if you're there, you better do something now. I can't do it no more. I just can't do it my way another day. And when I was on my knees surrendering to God the program of Alcox and now it's my home group, it just, the meeting just got over. They just said the Lord's Prayer. And they passed the basket around and they collected enough money to buy me the big book on tape. 
And, and, and I believe that's a God story because if it's not a God story, why didn't they buy that big book on tape a couple years before or a week before? You know, the, what I believe is when I surrendered to God in the program of Alcox Anonymous, God let them know, go ahead and spend the money on the tapes. He won't hawk them. And, <clears throat> you know, I started, you know, I, I started going to Alcox Anonymous with a different idea. I would do everything you tell me to do. I'll reach my hand out. Life's over. No fun. Boring, dull, and glum. And the doctors still this day tell me they don't know what keeps me alive. But, but back then I figured, you know what? Hopefully the doctors can keep me alive two years. Because, you see... What I want to do is I want to get involved in every kind of service Alcox Anonymous has to offer. I mean, I'm just going to jump in because, you know what, I want to prove to you guys that you can do everything here that Alcox Anonymous has to offer, and life's still no fun. I want to make sure I never have a smile on my face, never day one. <laughs> and hopefully at two years sober I can die. And you know how the book talks about grandiose thinking and stuff that we have. Well, I'm figuring that... You know, in two years when I die and I've done everything Alcoholics Anonymous has to offer, they'll build this monument for me. <laughs> now, not no little monument, big monument. And they'll write on there that, that Matt Green, sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous, died two years sober. Life was no fun, boring, dull, and glum. And I figured newcomers from all over the world could come see this monument. <laughs> And see that, you know, you can do the deal, but it's no fun. But you don't have to drink. I figured so many of them would come, they'd probably build a tent city out there, you know. <laughs> God, we are sick, ain't we? Oh, I am. <laughs> and so what happened is I got involved in service. And, and you know, uh, you know, I became a secretary. And that really chapped my hide. You know, they tell you to get involved in service, you know. And, so I get a secretary position. The second meeting, they come over and tell me, Matt, you, you gotta resign as secretary. Screw you guys. You tell you get involved in service and, and then, uh, you know, you got good chances of staying sober and now you tell me my second meeting, I gotta resign. I go, screw you, screw A, I'm out of here, man. They said, Matt, let's explain something to you first. We have traditions in Alcoholics Anonymous and one of those traditions is we have to do what's best for the group as a whole. And they go, when a blind guy grabs a coffee pot and pours coffee, everybody scatters like heck, you know? <laughs> I, I mean, you know, once they explain it that way, I could kind of understand their point, you know? And, uh, so I don't make a good secretary. And, and still this day, I've never been allowed to be a treasurer ever. <laughs> You know, I, I just did the deals, and I didn't like it. Uh, I just did it because you said that would help keep you sober. And I, and I did it to prove you wrong that, that you could, couldn't have fun here. And it would piss me off when, when like, a, a sherry-drinking housewife would, would say something like, Matt, you got a smile on your face. And it's like, man, you don't even know how to drink. Get away from me, you know. <laughs> And then every now and then you'd catch, your, catch yourself letting your guard down and you'd start relating the feelings to that sherry drinking cookie housewife, you know. And God, that would just piss me off. I am not like her, you know. <gasps> I'm a bar drinking, fighting, not slinging kind of a guy, man. You know, I, I, you know, my bars are, you know, if they got a Harley Davidson half in and half out the window and you can smell the place a mile before you get there and there's, you know, blood on the floor and just, you know, the mirrors are all broken, you know, and, you know, when you walk in and you see fists flying from the start, those are my kind of bars. I love to fight. You should have seen me when I bartended. For no reason at oh, all, you piss me off. I just reach over and grab a fifth and just pull you over the bar and smack you in the head, you know. And call the cops. You were disturbing the peace in the bar. <laughs> but, yeah, back to sobriety. You know, so I, just, <laughs> oh, yeah. 
I, I just got real involved and, and did the things. And, and you know what? It really pissed me off early in sobriety. The old timers loved me. You know, it pissed me off. I'm all the way blind, and they would tell me to do stuff, and I'd tell them, hey, you know what? You only pick on me because I'm blind. I can't whip your butt. And it really pissed me off when I started seeing a little bit and found out they were smaller than me. <laughs> you know, and, and these old timers, they'd come over and make me read the big book of alcoholics. We study that big book. You know, and, and you know, you're three, four months sober and, and you're young and, and everybody else is running off to Monterey to the young people's dances and they're having a good time and ending up in a sack with each other. And that's what I want. That's fun. Sitting around with a bunch of these old codgers probably can't even get it up. We're starting the big book. And that, that's no fun. And after some months of that, I finally let them know, you know, I ain't doing this no more. You know, this is, this is not fun. You guys don't come over here no more. Don't bug me no more. I'm not studying that book no more. I'm dying. <laughs> Next night, they show up. And I told them, we're not studying that book. And they go, oh, we got new way to study the book. New way to study the book. So they took a little while to set everything up. And and uh, they set a VCR and a TV up and, and the binoculars, because I was starting to see a little bit by then, hardly nothing, but on this tripod and set it up right in front of me so it didn't wiggle or nothing. And and we would study that big book of alcoholics and that was for 15 minutes and we'd watch a triple X rated film for 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I don't think I have to tell you, I became a student of the big book of alcoholics and I'm as... You know, and a lot of things, you know, I, I did end up, I had uh, like 68 major surgeries in sobriety and, and uh, you know, I mean, my hospital rooms would pack with, with members of Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, I never got no rest. You know, I'd have 40-hour surgeries and I'd hurt like heck in these major grafts. And, and uh, people in the hospital would say, God, you have a lot of family because I'd be in ICU and stuff. And... And, uh, you know, I remember one time a 40 hour surgery that, that totally went ba- bad. And, and when I came to, I, I thought I'd died even. And the nurse comes and says, This guy says he's your brother. Is he really? He's black. I said, Yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> oh, yeah, that's my brother. <laughs> And, you know, some, some years passed by doing the deal on alcoholics and I was going to have my first surgery in San Francisco. I didn't tell nobody. You see, because those major graphs you've heard a lot. And the people in alcoholics and I was I know they just love you and they pray for you and, and they're just there to show you your support. But, but it's like your body needs time to heal, rest to heal properly. And, and I'm not saying that to get you to not go to the hospitals, but if you go see a, someone that has surgery or something, just drop in and say hi and leave. Let, let them get the rest they need to heal. You know, say a prayer with them and leave. You know, and, and so I'm going to San Francisco, and, and this is the first time this head plastic surgeon for the whole world is going to work on me. And, and uh, he wants to schedule, so he doesn't. he's going to be there the whole 10 days I'm there. And, and uh, you know, I don't tell nobody I'm going. I'm going to go up there, I'm going to get rest. I'm the spiritual guru. I'm speaking at conferences in A. I go into prisons. I sponsor a million guys. And, you know, I just do the general service work. I'm intergroup chairman. I volunteer at central office. I mean, I just do the deal. I can go do this deal for 10 days by myself. Get some rest. And I get up there and they did the surgery and someone screwed up. They scheduled my my plastic surgeon to be on vacation. One, he does one a year where nobody knows where he's at so he can enjoy it. And they scheduled that right after the day after my surgery. And they can't change the orders unless the doctor changes it. So now all of a sudden I can't eat. I can't do anything. And I'm not connected with A. And I start getting a little slightly tipsy out of control feeling. And then I get pissed. 
by seven days with doing it Matt's way, the spiritual guru in AA, I'm calling up to my mom to get me a plane ticket, prepay for a plane ticket with my credit card so I can get out of San Francisco. And I jerked IVs out of my arms. I'm going to leave. Don't know where the San Francisco airport is, but I'm out of here, man. Screw this crap. I'm nutting up really bad. And my mom calls the H&I chairman for Fresno, and he calls the the guy that runs central office in San Francisco, and, and he got a hold of the, the chairman for the H&I committee in San Francisco that goes into San Quentin prison, and he got up there right before I left. And he started talking to me about the, what's going on in the prisons in San Quentin and Alcoholics Anonymous in San Francisco. And I started talking to him about what was going on in the prisons in our area and what was going on in AA in Fresno. And he left, and God, I was feeling really good. You see, the, the, those doctor's orders never changed for the rest of the 10 days. Like the next day, the, the guy, Erwin from Central Office, he sent a newcomer, brand new one day newcomer, came into Alcoholics Anonymous to find out, to the office there to find out how to stay sober. And he sent this newcomer out to my hospital room. And you got to realize I had a, a major graphs and my whole head's full of uh, gauze pads and, and uh, these su- these uh, tubes hooked to the inside of my head with these suction balls in my pockets and flu- and they were clear tubes and, and fluid would suck out of the inside of my head going into these suction balls and they had my whole head gauze gauze bandaged up and full of blood and, and this one day newcomer comes in the hospital and said, Everyone sent me here to find out from you how to stay sober. I and I cornered this guy in the corner, you know, I'm telling him all this stuff. I'm telling him if you want what I got, you know, here's <laughs> <laughs> And, and I don't know if that kid stayed sober, but see what I'm trying to tell you is, see, nothing in my life changed. Those doctors' orders never changed. My doctor never came back. The only thing I did was got reconnected back up with Alcoholics Anonymous, and and I didn't get reconnected back up because I'm so involved in service. Someone reconnected me back up. See now, if I if I just go to meetings and, and sit in the back of the room, as soon as the, the speaker's done, split out the door, I can't be connected back up with Alcoholics Anonymous because you don't know me. See, so I have to stay involved in this deal. And, and so I, you know, I ended up having a really enjoyable three days in that hospital, and nothing changed except for I got rehooked back up with Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> I've never tried to do life. I hear people say, God, there's life besides AA. I don't know. Maybe for them, not for me. It tells me I have to practice these principles in all my affairs. That means I have to take AA with me everywhere for everything I do everywhere I go. I have to take AA and these principles with me. You know, a lot of things in sobriety has happened that I didn't want to happen. And, and thank God I've stayed involved in service because I, I go to a lot of meetings. I hear people say they quit doing service and then they quit doing the meetings and then they're back. And if they didn't drink, they're just emotionally screwed up. But most of them drink. And if they get the privilege to come back, you know, I, I hear those stories. Because a lot of times I think, you know what, I've done enough. I've done my share. And there's still times I bitch about going all the way, hour and a half out to the prison. Get out there and... We can't get in because the count's screwed up, and we have an hour and a half meeting all the way back. And I think, you know what, I work, and, you know, I'm tired. I, I don't want to go. I think of all the reasons all the way out there not to go there. And then all the way back, I thank God for the privilege of the opportunity to be able to do it. You know, they performed the wrong surgery on my little boy. And thank God I don't do this deal alone. That's a weed deal. You know, and, uh, so the guys I sponsored went through this with me and, and one time home from the hospital, this was over almost a couple of months doing surgeries to correct the screwed up surgeries and I went home to take a shower and they called me and they said, Matt, you better get back down here. 
your little boy is not expected to make it through the night. And I slam that phone down. I put my fist through the door, and, and I'm going to go kill me a doctor. And, and this ex-convict I sponsored and this idiot attorney I sponsored, they grab me and they throw me down on the floor because they see I'm nutting up. And, and they tell me, Matt, we're going to pray. And I screw you, screw praying, screw AA, and screw God. I'm going to go kill me a doctor. They say, Matt, we're going to pray. I said, let me up. I'm your sponsor. <laughs> And, uh, and <laughs> they uh, they weren't real impressed with that either, you know. <laughs> I thought, okay, I'll, I'll you know I'll make these guys happy. I'll pray with them. They'll let me up. I'll go kill that doctor. And the power of prayer, because I prayed with those guys and not meaning it either. But those guys praying for me and my little boy, and me lipping the prayers. When I got up, I didn't want to kill that doctor anymore. I wasn't happy about it, but I didn't want to kill that doctor anymore. And we got through that deal, and, and my little boy's alive. And he likes to, God, we go somewhere, and they'll go, Dad, lift your shirt up. And I'll lift it up, and he'll lift his up and see me. And my dad got scars alike, you know, and he thinks it's really neat. And, and I'll tell you that the joys that's worth more than all the money in the world is, is when you drag a newcomer home and you're tired and your little boy tells you, Daddy, that's okay, you go to bed, I'll finish. <laughs> and you get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, you walk down that hallway out to the living room and there's a dim light on and your little boy's got the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and he's got he's standing over the newcomer laying on the couch wanting to go to sleep and he says, now dummy, if you just do this in the book, you'll stay sober. You know? <laughs> And you get those tears of joy in your eye and you thank God for the privilege and, and, you know, and all the money in the world can't buy stuff like that. You see, I told you me and Peggy got married and, and three weeks before we got married, my father-in-law died. I loved that old man and he was a decent old man and, and, you know, before this he, he came one time and, and he asked if he could talk to me and, I said, yeah, but in my mind, I'm going, here's a father-in-law, future father-in-law talk coming, you know. I mean, I've been through those before. <laughs> and uh, he asked Peggy to leave the room. I go, oh, this is really a bad one, you know. And Peggy left the room, and, and, and we sat down, and he told me, Matt, I've been praying here lately. And, and he goes, this is how I'm praying. And he told me, and he goes, Matt, is that the right way to pray? And I was able to tell Lee that it doesn't matter. As long as you're praying, it's the right way. But and it doesn't matter what I told him or what he told me. The deal is, is, is how do you get from being a scum bucket slime ball in the world to where a decent old man asks you if that's the right way to pray? That's worth more than all the money in the world. That's worth more than any Mercedes, any mansion, anything in the world. That means a lot to me. You know, and both my parents died last year, uh, about four months apart from each other, and. Because of the, see, my dad wanted to die at home. And, and there was a, medical things that had to be done to him for that to happen. And I have a lot of brothers and sisters, and and they couldn't stand seeing our dad that way, and they couldn't stand touching him because he felt yucky. And and my wife's in al and she's real involved in service, and, and I'm real involved in service in Alcox and Alcox, and we learn that we do the deal whether we like it or not. We just show up and we do the deal. And so we were able to take care of my dad till he died, to almost live there at their house. And, and my brothers and sisters call us saints. And we're not saints. We just have a program that's taught us a way to do this, whether we like it or not. You know, we knew my dad was dying, and, and we ran up to the bed. And, and when I got sober and made those amends to my dad, and we started to have a beautiful relationship, I called him Shiny. And I ran up to the bed, and I, I go, Dad, when you get up there, tell him I call you shiny. And my dad hadn't opened his eyes in a couple of days, and he opened his eyes. And he nodded his head, yes, and he closed his eyes, and he died. And I call those spiritual experiences that I get experience because of Alcoholics Anonymous and the service here in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, there's a lot of things like that that's happened. You know, the, my old-timer best friend, you know, and he was dying. He, he told me, Matt, climb up. You know, I took all the guys I sponsor over there every day, and, 
And he wouldn't let the other guys. He'd tell me, Matt, climb up into the bed and let's talk about the good old days. And what he meant, because I'd climb up on that bed and put my arms around that old man and tell him I love him. And we'd talk about the prisons we went to or all the places he drove me all over the country when he speaking and all the service meetings we went to. And, and, you know, and that was a privilege to get away there with that old man and talk about the good old days in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I pray to God that I never get so selfish and self-centered that I, that I think that I, I have to step aside and let the newcomer do the service in Alcoholics Anonymous. I hope I never get that selfish and self-centered. You know, these things that seem, you know, these people dying, and, you know, those are spiritual experiences. I've had the privilege of getting to hold people and do things for people. Those things mean more than anything in the world. I'll get rid of that crying stuff. Uh, let me tell you what happened to me when I was two years sober. The state of California called me and said that I was eligible to have my driver's license back. They didn't call, they sent a letter. said I was eligible to have my driver's license back. So I thought I'd go down and humor them, and i take this letter down there, and they said, yeah, you're eligible to have your driver's license back. I said, but you don't understand. I, I'm blind. I can't see you take the test. And they said, no, you don't understand. You don't have to take a test. All you got to do is sign for it. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> I, I, I uh, told the guy to hold my hand, and I'd sign it. He did. And I'm a legal licensed driver in the state of California. <laughs> so if you're sitting there pounding and means because you haven't got your driver's license back, one day at a time, you know, if a blind guy can get back, so can you. <laughs> I'll close with this. I stole it from a guy that lives here in Florida now. You know, because that, that tenth step, that vital tenth step inventory that we need to do on a daily basis, he had bought at this retreat all these different deals that might work for you, you know, better. And, and it was a list. And, and on there, you know, it was like, you know, have I been a good person today to other people? Yeah, you know. And, and you know, have I cussed anybody out today? No. Yeah, you know, I'm starting to look like I'm a pretty good guy that day. You know, it goes on. And down at the bottom it says, Am I the kind of person my dog thinks I am? Yes. I fall short of that one. <laughs> but it gives me something to work on, and I appreciate you guys having me here. I love you, and God bless you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.